It's day 257 of Ukrainian resistance. Ukrainian Media Center Ukraine Forum continues its operation. My name is Vasil Samakhvalov, and we start our special event panel discussion, and we'll talk about the intentional militarization of education. We'll talk about the education, language, and culture as weapons of the Russian world, and how do they act in the occupied territory and how they would like to act in Ukraine and why it's so important for us. Our guests today are Olha Skripnik, the chairperson at the Crimean Humanitarian Rights Group, Valentina Potapova, head of Almenda Center for Civil Education, and Andriy Dikterenko, editor-in-chief of Realna Hazenta, and he's my homeboy from Luhansk region. And we will work up to one hour. We will have some speeches and presentation. And if anybody has any questions, please raise your hands and we will give you the microphone. So the first question, I think, is to Miss Olga, who will disclose the context of why this subject is so important. Is it real that the militarization of education is taking place in occupied areas? Why it's important for Ukraine? Thank you. My name is Olga Skripnik. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank everybody for attention to this subject. I represent the Crimean Human Rights Group. I'm from Crimea. And the another speakers are from the territories who back in 2014 we've seen that the war was already going on and we all take our efforts to return these territories and people there our organization is specialized first of all into documenting the violation of human rights and to war crimes of russia federation our team are the crimean journalists and uh, human rights protection personnel and we work in Crimea after 24th of July and to the extent of our capabilities we we try to document what's going on there and as uh, Miss Valentina I worked in the education area so this subject is very sensitive and close to us the subject we were taking care of since 2014 we keep track of this situation and answering your question why is it's important because it was exactly that necessary step for the russian federation to to proceed to the full-scale invasion and first and foremost is that the war didn't start today but not now but back in 2014 it now is just another stage so the preparation to this war started in crimea crimea became that base the platform so to say where russia trained its or tested its uh, instruments that it later transferred to the newly occupied territories and now we see that Crimea is one of the key military bases where the strikes are launched from. So in order for Crimea to become this military base, starting from 2014, Russia became its uh, militarization. They are not only in area of education, but in the area of uh, civil life as, as well, for, for, so that the society is ready for the full-scale invasion in Ukraine. There were three parallel tracks. First of all, it was the development of political persecutions, which started immediately, starting with the murder of Rishat Ametov, who protested the occupation, and it was a gradual clearing of everybody who protested the occupation, and more than 150 of our civilians are behind the bars now, and it's full er eradication of freedom of word, access to the free information. And the third track, important one, is the metallization. And first of all, in the area of education, there were two goals that we identified. First is the preparation of the society to the war that I just mentioned. And moreover, I will say that the militarization, militarization going on in the occupied Crimea is a documented war crime. We have evidence, and in 2021, the prosecutor's office of Crimea submitted, submitted a communication to the International Criminal Court where it was 
prove that the propaganda of the military service in the Russian armed forces among the children is the war crime by Russian Federation. So the process is long already. And it was directed at eradication of Ukrainian identity, cultural and civil identity. And even now we see that this process intensified and by the experience of Miss Valentina, she will add something, but I see some tendencies that emerged after the 24th of February, Russian Federation, Putin specifically, added to the criminal and administrative legislation in, uh, on the 4th of March that are used to persecute people in the area of education. For example, uh, some teachers were penalized who, who tried to say what's really going on in Ukraine, in occupied Crimea, that Russia attacked Ukraine, that there are no fascists in Ukraine, and on contrary, there are some in Russia, and that was the reason for their persecution. Another teacher on the 1st of September decorated the classroom with the yellow and blue balloons for what she was fired from the school. So some teachers still try to bring the truth to the students, but they get under repression. And talking about this article, it's the article for discreditation of Russian army. So it's absurd and the practice we already studied, at least 120 these administrative cases against teachers, activists and just regular people. In, in, in general, it all comes down to the fact that if you call war what it is, a war, it, it's a crime. And the same for the teachers, for the same in the whole education system, you can't call the war a war. Uh, or y y using the slogan, I'm for peace or I'm against the war. So if you're saying that there is war going on, you don't accept the term special operation. And in fact, you cannot call the things what they are. And it obviously reflects in the education system. What's important is that Russian Federation for this time used uh, all, all its capabilities to cover the children to the maximum extent and all levels from all sides. So it's militarization, not only of formal education, not uh, during r classes, lessons, all the re religious, cultural organizations, they were involved in this process. So if, peop if the children are not in school, they're at some sport competition, and all these sport competitions were always militarized, so they were the children were prepared to go to the Russian army. If it's a religious event, it's the same thing. And it's going on for the ninth year already, so the scale is gigantic. Children don't have any alternative because both in school and outside school, the militarization process is going on. It's not only cadet classes, but it's the regular life of children, which is under the influence of such militarization. So before I pass the microphone, not to take a lot of time from my colleagues, the only thing I would like to add to specify to detailize, I think that the track of militarization of Russian education started not like eight or nine years ago. It started after the Orange Revolution and after the return to 9th of May as the main narrative in the Russian society, the main staple. We've seen the renaissance of the patriotic movements, of the young army as the instrument of the patriotic education of the youth. We've seen the lessons emerging and after 2014 it became clearly anti-Ukrainian and we see that Russians were preparing children to war against Ukraine even back then because now those who are in the army who fight against Ukraine are those who started studying back in 2004. They already come to this war prepared, how, how do I say it, morally or amorally. Miss Valentina, maybe you can tell us more in, in detail about how do they change children into future soldiers. Thank you, really, in my opinion, 
the militarization we're talking about now is just a component, is just a part of other crime. And that crime is uh, more of a genocide nature crime, because when uh, Russian Federation captured Crimea, and Crimea was the first, and in less than a month, it it became a, uh, the captured areas were added by the Lugansk and Donetsk region, and the Russia faced the issue of uh, what to do with the uh, children that were born during Ukrainian independence and who consider Ukraine their homeland. I don't agree that it started back in 2004, because when we started working on development of the civil society in Crimea, it was year 9-14. We've seen the changes happening to the youth who didn't remember the Soviet era who did not remember that ice cream or whatever was supposed to be remembered from the uh, Soviet Union. And those children, they were feeling themselves the citizens of Ukraine. So what are you going to do with the citizens of Ukraine who became that protest layer? Because we know that for Putin, specifically the youth, is the protest layer who followed Navalny, who don't accept Putin as the only leader of their country. And moreover, there is the occupied Crimea, occupied parts of Donbass, where the youth does not accept other, other state. And you have to do something with that youth. You have to deal with it. You have to eradicate their, eradicate their identity, their Ukrainian identity, and to replace it with Russian one. So if for the youth who is under the rule of the Russian Federation, those processes were slow, here they had to act quickly. And we can remember Bismarck, who was saying that to build a nation, you need a you need a small war that ends with victory. And this is exactly why to eradicate the identity, to switch, to transfer more than half a million children to Russian mentality, militarization was necessary. And those processes were happening in formal education. First of all, it was the prohibition of the Ukrainian history and almost full prohibition of Ukrainian language in schools and the emergence of so-called militaristic cadet Cossack classes. For what I understand, you may say more in detail, it's propaganda that, that was planted in all the links of uh, school education is the replacement of teachers and and that's why the program of uh, uh, local teachers appeared in Crimea when the right teachers or wrong teachers were replaced with right teachers who were coming from Russia and in, for, and in the area of informal education, you can imagine that before 2015, Russian Federation did not build or did not r renew such a Soviet format of unification of children under some militaristic organization. And specifically in year 15, we have seen the young army emerge who submit to the Ministry of Defense and not to the Ministry of Education. And this young army is a significant step to militarization. Further on, through a vast number of programs, of mil militarized programs, uh, like children's camps, uh, which was built uh, with the purpose not, not to uh, the Artek camp, which was constructed as a camp to unite the children from all over the world, we can see militaristic changes in there. Uh, 
like the investigation committee of Russian Federation meeting, who established militaristic games in the in that camp, and we see that the Russian militaristic game Zarnitsa is being reestablished, and something else is built, something that did 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 not exist in. Uh, did not exist in Soviet Union. It's Zarnichka game, which uh, covers the children in the age of seven to nine, which even so Soviet Union did not achieve. And it happens specifically for building the Crimean model, and specifically this Crimean model in express mode is what we are seeing in the occupied territories of Zaporizhia and Kherson regions is the all, all, almost exact copy but in case of Crimea it was eight years so in Kherson and the Parisian regions it happens in real time within half a year and we're seeing the same the destruction of study books destruction of Europe uh, for Ukrainian language and militarization so and on the 12th of October there was a solemn opening of the first unit of young army in the Parisian region I would just like to clarify for those who don't know Zarnitsa is a Russian game for the children who were playing uh, war actually uh, the children were taught that when they become adults, they go to war. So now that you mentioned that there is Zarnishka, it covers the children from seven to nine years, they play war. They play war at seven years. So they're being taught to become soldiers at this young age. I will add another minor argument to the fact that the, the system of education acts in the interests of the military in the occupied Crimea. So we submitted this order as the evidence to the International Criminal Court. There is an order, the, the resolution of the Ministry of Defense, who specifies the means to be taken in the schools. So the Ministry of Defense gives orders how to build the education process, not the Ministry of Education, but Ministry of Defense. And it listed different sport and cultural events, the formats to be used, and so on and so forth. It tells us that the education in the Russian system is fully submitted to the interests of Russian Federation Defense, the militaristic interests we're talking about now. I will add a little bit more to give you more facts. Starting from 2018 in Artec, in the children's camp of Artec, the School of Future Commanders started operating and there, I don't know how to put it and how to interpret it in another way, but that school is exactly where those children are prepared who can go to the army in future and to become the commanders. Unfortunately, now I don't have... I don't have details of how many graduates of this school currently fight the war in Ukraine, but they definitely do because those who go to cadet classes, now they grew up and now they are at this war. And maybe now Mr. Andriy may join who has some specific research on how these cadet classes operated. Good afternoon, my name is Andriy Dekhtirenko, I'm a journalist from Lugansk region. And back in the day, I was the editor-in-chief of the printed editorial The Real Gazette. And now that we cannot work in the occupied territory, I left, but I keep researching what's going on in the occupied territories and Luhansk region is specific. Specifically, we do our journalistic investigations. I will tell you about the details we gathered in our investigation dated April this year the Kazakh invasion of Donbass, the occupied part of the Lugansk region. Andriy, if you can explain for our for our foreign journalists who are the Cossacks. We were talking about the Don Cossacks. It's an interesting question actually who they are. In fact, they consider themselves a separate ethnos, like southern, uh, southern uh, Russian ethnos. And in fact, those who know history, they know that Russian Empire used Cossacks as the forward military force 
avant-garde military force in both military for both military functions and police functions but traditionally those people live in the lower areas of Don River and is the part of great Don uh, force uh, who entered the Donbass region and Russians made a stake that this Donbass youth should be educated in this Cossack culture because they think that culture close to them. Is it, is it similar to Sipai or Yanachar troops? Yes, I think that the Cossacks, we know the role they played in Ukrainian history. It's interesting how in Luhansk region the descendants of these Zaporizhia Cossacks live on one uh, one bank of uh, Siversky Donetsk and on the other bank there are Don Cossacks living, the descendants of Don Cossacks living. And now Russians use it for the military education of the, of the children below 18. So let's talk about what was going on in occupied Luhansk region. As of today, there are two uh, children's cadet corps existing now. They uh, account they comprise in total two, oh, 412 children. And the number of uh, Cossack classes was gradually, gradually growing starting from 2018. So from 2018, 2019, there were only eight classes. In one year, it was 18. In one year more, it was 33. And in 21, 22 study years, it was 62 classes which comprised 1,200 children. We researched what were the uh, study books, manuals studied in those classes, and we found one developed in Luhansk region, the school course for grades 5-11, the history and culture of Luhansk region Cossacks. And after we researched all those manuals we we found the directions the air the areas children are trained in this is religious education military training and they are talking specifically russian moscow patriarchate orthodox church those are the family patriarchal tradition that there is it's only men and women genders who exist the men has to go to war and women women have to stay at home and they talk about the lgbt propaganda in ukraine a lot and the ideological education the ideals of russian empire so many people who take care of the Cossack traditions there, they are the leaders of the thoughts there. I, I will specify the fact that uh, Russia needs an empire and they need a Tsar is the story that they discuss absolutely seriously. And the second part of this ideologic processing is the anti-Ukrainian political information. So they tell in a distorted way of what's going on in Ukraine. And what we started talking with Vasil, firstly, is the implementation, the planting of these Cossack ideas that children are being explained that they are the descendants of the Cossacks. So, and if they are not, so they can be so-called baptized as Cossacks. So they accepted, uh, they are being accepted to this order. And uh, it's necessary to say about this minor detail that in those Cossack course, Cossack classes, when they graduate, they don't only swear this allegiance, but uh, the, the, there is a ceremony uh, in the traditions of the 19th century where they get the don't in the Cossack u uniform. The, there is a ball where they dance with uh, girls and this is something planted in their brains during the classes. So who are the curators of this Cossack education in Luhansk region? So two people who implemented this process are Sergei Yurchenko and uh, Miss Olga maybe knows that person because he's from Crimea, Bakshi Sarai. He was the representative of Cossacks there in Crimea. We researched it, and it's uh, part of our research that discovered the information that he cooperated with, with FSB, and then he is, uh, 
came to Lukashenko to take control over the Cossack movements. It's a little bit different subject that the Cossack movements in Luhansk region did not always want to submit to Lugansk National Republic government. And another person is Alexei Selivanov, who is actually a Kiyevite, who headed the local communities of Cossacks in Kiev, and then he went to Lugansk National Republic to take control of this process of Cossack education, and he was uh, transferred to the occupied part of the Zaporizhia region, where he became the deputy minister of internal affairs. And then he disappeared there and re-emerged as a blogger who just comments the situation in occupied Donbass. Now it's important, let's talk about the curators of the curators. Those are the people who are very strongly connected with the Cossack education and implementation of this militaristic education in Russia. First of all, it's Viktor Vodovatsky, is the deputy of the Russian Duma, and he's the, the head of so-called the Don Cossack troops who controls the Cossacks in Rostov region. So he works, so to say, with the adult Cossacks who establishes communication with them. And this person near Mr. Yurchenko on the right is Mikola Doluda. He's the least known, but maybe most important out of all of them. He's a former serviceman who was uh, a de deputy governor of Krasnodar region in Kuban because he was one of the main ideologists of, for implementation of the Cossack militaristic education in Kuban region. We were saying that in Luhansk region as of now, I mean the, in the previously occupied territories, that now there are 62 classes and Cossack Corps, for example, in Kuban region, it's only eight of them, eight of such Cossacks, and four four thousand five hundred fifty spe specialized Cossack classes, and these people, in fact, it's a great percentage of the secondary education in Kuban region. We understand why there, there is a, a, a lot of anti-Ukrainian education there, because many graduates went to the war against Ukraine, and some of those who went to the war against Ukraine are the graduates of Lugansk Cossack classes. And to one of my namesakes, Andriy Dekhter, almost my namesake, Andriy Dekhterenko, who perished uh, during this special operation, he's a graduate of this Lugansk institution. And another one who takes care of the Cossack education now is Andriy Turchak, is the secretary of uh, United Russia, a person close to Putin, and he sponsored this movement for a long time. Oh, oh, the person who sponsored this movement is Konstantin Malafeev, who sent books in the uh, imp imperial spirit to educate, to educate those children in this way. So let's talk about the plans for 2022 in the newly occupied territories of Luhansk region. First of all, is the screenshot from Luhansk occupation information center that they had Mr. Turchak coming to us to Starobilsk. They were coming to the higher school there and they said that it's good that we opened the Cossack cadet corps there in Starobilsk. So in uh, June 2022 they decided to open to open two more Cossack cadet corps named after Vasil Margelov and Mikhail Sholokhov. I I will tell you right away that they didn't make it open in anything there. We understand that Kremina is now in the forward edge of the battle area and in Starobilsk they just didn't have enough time to open it and they want to open the same classes in Lysychansk, Starobilsk and Svatova. And not to be mistaken, I will tell you how Russians, to what extent Russians care specifically about the education of the children in the occupied territories and what does it tell us. For example, we know that in the occupied territories in December 2022, 
the Russian the Russian uh, representatives of Russian authorities started being appointed to the posts in the government of that area. Ivan Kusov was appointed the, as administrator of the education from Krasnodar region. He was appointed in Luhansk nation, uh, People's Republic for the same post. And this Mikola Daluda was in, responsible for the same there for the graduates of Kazakh cadet classes in the occupied Crimea to uh, assist to those green people, the Russian people who captured the peninsula. Now in the whole occupied territory, specifically in Lugansk region, every Monday, for example, today is Monday, so children from the 1st to 11th grade, they start their study day from the out-of-school time, which is called the conversation about the important and those are the patriotic education, political information. And what's interesting, it complies with the ideological context, specifically the topic, for example, of fatherland, which uh, originates from the word father, which uh, was uh, taking place right away after the birthday of Vladimir Putin, and it was emphasized in the school of Lugansk region. So it's really an important issue, and we were talking for a long time of how to get uh, Donbass and Crimea back, that those issues may be solved, and the occupiers, they understand it pretty well, and they do everything they can so that the young, young generation goes to the war right after the graduation from school. For those who get educated in those Cossack classes, it's quite natural for them. They are educated in this paradigm and we hope for just quick deoccupation which will stop that uh, thank you very much for this profound research i have a kind of summary for you do we understand it correctly that the education processes in russia are being taken care of by the ministry of defense and out of school education is being taken care of Russian Ministry of Defense and FSB, and do we understand it right that Russia converted uh, energy carriers into weapon, they converted culture into weapon, and now they convert education into weapon. And, and rephrasing Chekhov, this uh, weapon is either shot already or is about to shoot soon. I, now that I have a microphone, this Mikola Daluda is a former Russian serviceman. He's appointed to the Krasnodar region. He's appointed the deputy governor, and he starts creating this Cossack cadet course. And this one of the schemes of cooperation between the military structures and the structures of education. I think that these uh, examples, they say for themselves. I want to add that I wouldn't say that the education is being taken care of by the Ministry of Defense, because in my opinion, it's the synergy that already happened in Russian Federation when all the ministries now work for war. And I want to quote the Ministry of Education that was set in the beginning of the occupation of Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. And the quote is as follows. It's necessary to create, to conceal the population by repression of pro-Ukrainian state policies in culture and education, to remove the educational materials and prohibit all the uh, educational programs which have Ukrainian content. So is the task set by the Minister of Education and it's understood that it cannot appear just out of nothing because it was coordinated with the head of this state, Vladimir Putin. And as to the conversation about the important things that you mentioned, I will just tell you their names because they are quite eloquent. For the children of the first to, to the fourth grade, those are the general topics, the heroes of special operations. For the grades five to seven, and I would 
emphasized significantly the friends and enemies of Russian Federation because now we're talking that the problem which exists in Ukraine is the problem of the world, not only the problem of Ukraine. And for the students of eight to nine grades, uh, the Donetsk and people, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, People's Republic, that they are Russia, and for the 10th to 11th grade, is the, there, is a, the, there is a profession to defend your land and the advantages of the service in the armed forces of Russian Federation. So it's actually a plan of, for preparation the children for their participation in war. You are right, you graduate from school, you go to army. And this is the way they build the uh, education system as if there is no other future for the people. So responding to a question, in my opinion, the last at least 20 years in Russia, the system built in Russia was the one that all the ministries, cultural authorities were directed at service in the interests of Putin. And they, this synergy are colleagues talk about is something that's happening already and as to the Cossacks, their formations in the same way they played their role in Crimea even before 2014 they were curated by FSB they were financed by uh, Russian budget and it was one of the forces that Russian troops relied upon when they were occupying Crimea and as an example the representatives of Cossack forces actually were the ones who kidnapped Rishat Akhmetov, who was the first victim of Russian regime. It was exactly Cossacks who kidnapped him, who put him in the vehicle, and he, whose body was found with the traces of torture, tortures, uh, in this, uh, with the same torches that now we find in Bucha and Izum. So it's an old practice. So yes, those formations are curated by FSB. And everything Russia does now is the servicing of the interests of specific people. This is why we, we see this synergy. And in the same way, these Cossacks are being used now in the full-scale invasion. And so-called head of Crimea stated that at least 1,200 so-called volunteers were sent to war against Ukraine. And out of them, the majority are the representatives of these Cossack formations. In the same way, these Cossacks constantly take part in different... Uh, events for the children they come to the classes to the lessons and they and they say how to kill the ho holes so we understand that all those events are being uh, accompanied by the language of hatred which was used in Crimea for a lot of time you can find this information on the website of our organization but what's important this language of hatred uh, Mr. Andre mentioned propaganda, so the same is happening in Crimea. The key message is that the enemies are Ukrainians and Ukrainian church and taters and the Muslims and LGBT as well. So those are the key messages. But right before the full-scale invasion and now after the 24th of February, this language of hatred is... Uh, something that transitioned to another level and now it's another war crime it's the inciting of genocide those so the uh, controlled media the organization who work with children they uh, translate the messages which call to killing the ukrainians so it's another war crime of russian federation that has the scale of which is so big that the risk of your Russian propaganda is a great challenge to all other countries of the civilized world, specifically now when there is such a big number of uh, good Russians and uh, Russian journalists and in, who are in fact the propagandists who went, who left for Europe and it's now directed not only at Ukrainians. So all those things are very interrelated. Now that you mentioned Sergei Yurchenko, He's the direct example, just like Hirkin, he was creating his own Crimean army, which had their base in Chongar, where they kept Ukrainian activists and tortured them. And then he left to the territories of Donbass region and continued doing what he was doing before. And Sergei Yurchenko, along with a number of other people who had their experience in Crimea, they went to Donbass. Do you have any questions, please? 
please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Andrei Svetina, yes, inform. Can you please tell us, can you please comment the prohibition by the so-called governor of Crimea, Aksenov, the prohibition for performance of Ukrainian songs in Crimea and application of criminal punishment to those who perform these songs, even no matter that according to the Russian legislation, there are three official languages in Crimea, they are Russian, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar language. Is it barbarism or what? Yeah, Margarita Simonian called for singing the song, the Ukrainian song, the moon is so full in the night. Uh, yeah, this informal prohibition, this informal restriction exists. So this uh, Russian legislation, which uh, existed, first of all, to persecute the people, not to protect them, it's you, the article uh, used there is the discreditation of Russian army. So Ukrainian songs formally are considered those but by the judges in Crimea are considered discreditation. So if you sing a Ukrainian song, the judge will consider it as a discreditation of the army and it's a penalty, uh, at, at least. And it can also be considered an extremist song and it's already some criminal uh, offense. And for example, the Chervona Kalina son was considered by the judges as the extremist son, as the information which is, uh, we, promulgation of which is restricted in the occupied Crimea. So what it is, it's just a con continuation of the war crime by Russian Federation, and it's the extension of what Valentina was talking about, is the destruction of any expressions of Ukrainian identity. So we document those facts. For us, is the evidence of the war crime of Russian Federation, the international crimes. It's not some simple restriction, but I have to emphasize that it's uh, not formal, it's informal. So Aksenov, who calls not to perform those songs and you maybe you've seen the examples when people who were seeing those songs or the DJs who put this song they had to be publicly r repent to say that it was some mistake so again they try to create some propaganda content out of this so we understand that people are being forced to excuse themselves so they got FSB involved who intimidate people and this is how you can see those excuses but as of today starting from maybe August we already have a number of cases like this documented when people were really persecuted for Ukrainian sons and we understand that it will continue for them the Ukrainian son is another symbol of resistance and for Putin the problem is that the same as back in 2014 why he was building this system of political persecution so no matter the, even that this myth exists that the Crimea is Russian if there are Ukrainian activists protesting Russian occupation or Crimean Tatar protesters that's why they were so violently persecuted now they state that Crimea supports the war. Yes, there are Crimeans who are in the ranks of Russian army. At least 139 Crimeans perished who uh, fought on the Russian side. And those are the contract servicemen. We identified at least 70 of them, but there are those drafted as well who were forcibly taken and brought to, to Ukraine to take part in the warfare. But the resistance in Crimea exists, so it poses a risk to them because those sons are the expression of uh, resistance, specifically after the explosions in Novofedorivka, the strikes on the Russian uh, military bases in Crimea, the, the strikes performed by our army, so they take those sons very seriously and they know that there is no such support in Crimea, no such the support of Putin and war as they try to talk about and this is how they are trying to suppress it even through Ukrainian sons. I want to give you another example of suppression on the 24th of August. Two 
students in their personal web pages in social media they congratulated ukrainians with their independence day the director of the school where these children studied he was fired immediately on the 24th of august so it's the summer vacation time actually so the director was renewed in uh, re reinstated in her position and the parents were called for conversation as to the inallowability of such actions any more questions yes please one more question don't you think that the occupiers use the government of ukraine with the purpose to r repeat the genocide of ukrainians in the same way that it happened in cambodia in 76 79 where the Prime Minister of Cambodia, Pol Pot, the dictator, put the country on course to the radical re-establishment of the society by establishing the model of no goods economy, a relocation of the uh, municipal dwellers to the rural areas, destruction of money, the creation of cooperatives and people's communes. In reality, you know, our war is something that's horrible enough by itself uh, of what was happening in different regions. I don't want to talk about Bucha because the same things were happening in Severodonetsk and Mariupol and other parts of the Donetsk regions. Region. I don't see any need of historic parallels. They work until certain limit always. And the story happening in Ukraine, thanks God, I'm happy. Well, it's a weird feeling, but as the journalist investigator, everything that happens under the conditions of total digitalization, we can find out of what's going on like directly at once, right away, of what's going on in the occupied territories, what they write in occupied territories, even no matter that our website is blocked there, people have VPN, they can read it, and they can find out what's going on in Ukraine, some options, the, something that propaganda talks about. We can research it without the use of any stereotypes or schemes. And in reality, this is something we can do more, more to more extent than rather than looking for some parallels and under the condition of absence information to add something to your picture by yourself. You have to do everything you can to find out what's really going on and to make your conclusion building at least 99% of the picture yeah it's golden words about the metaphors i will add that really we are always trying to try to see what was going on historically but i want to support my colleague no matter how it sounds ukraine just in the same way that other armed conflicts it we have our unique experience and we currently document the inciting of genocide. It's a war crime. We were studying uh, the experience of Rwanda and other countries, but Ukraine is different in scale and in the scale of digitalization because everybody remembers this Rwanda case and the radio of Thousand Hills, but it was absolutely different context, other technical capabilities. So today we draw the attention to this inciting of genocide because taking into account the current technical capabilities is quite a different scale of tragedy and quite a different scale of consequences but talking about what russia is using for genocide we can say that we see uh, some evidence of this crime they use russian citizens to destroy ukraine uh, they use uh, russian army to destroy ukraine and ukrainians so that's why first of all it's important to understand who is first of all responsible for what's happening and it's russian when they have to understand that it's russian federation but the experience uh, we need to take into account certain experiences but what ukrainian goes through now is the experience to be studied in future by many and the example of ukrainian armed forces is the example of what's going on here in ukraine 
is changing the world right now and maybe will change it in future. I want to also support my colleagues that it's probably not worth taking some historic parallels because when the definition of genocide was taking place, it was the year 1984 and it was the era of 20 20th century technologies, but now that we say that one of the components of genocides is the forced relocation from one ethnic group to another ethnic group, we understand that it's not something that will happen in a way that it was happening back in century 20, because forced relocation can happen through, can take place through digital technologies, through something that we're talking about now, through militarization, through Cossack classes, through Cossack lessons, with a number, using a number of instruments. And when we see that within the eight years, they managed to educate our children, our Ukrainian children, into something, into somebody who says that their homeland is Russian Federation and they are ready to die for their homeland. This is the evidence of genocide. This is the evidence of relocation. Because if, if we orient only on the experience of the 20th century, so we would stay in the 20th century. But now we're in, we say that we're in the century 21. We have up-to-date technologies and we have new challenges. We're, we're trying to fight, we're trying to counter with the help of almost the whole world. And right now, r Russians are performing forced deportation of Ukrainians from Kherson region, which increases in scale the relocation of Crimean Tatars in course. Let's take last question and let's finish. Good afternoon again. Uh, Lorenzo Cremonesi from Correa della Sera from Milano, from Italia. Sorry, just to give a dimension to this interesting uh, uh, conference uh, that you are giving to us. Uh, you know, if we want to understand uh, what happened in uh, Crimea, you generally go to Wikipedia <laughs> and try to see the, the numbers. What, but uh, maybe you can give us an updating of the demographical situation. So first of all, I have three or four questions, very specific, um, to, to, to try to understand the situation today. We are talking of how many people are living today. Who, how many are the inhabitants of Crimea today? Uh, and how many were in 2014? Because, you know, I see different numbers and very vague uh, numbers. First of all, how many children are you talking about? You're talking about school in Crimea. How many children of this age are under the influence of this propaganda? Third, do you know how many uh, people left Ukraine, uh, sorry, Crimea, to go to the West, to go to Ukraine? And how many people were moved from the Russian to Crimea? Just, no, really, it's, it's, it's important, because since you're expert on this, it's the first time that I have the opportunity to talk with experts about this, uh, this situation. Uh, and the last uh, question, we uh, were in Odessa just a few weeks ago, we spoke with some, there is a kind of a, a, an NGO of um, uh, Kozak there. So they claim... Ukrainian or Russian Kozak? <laughs> that's a good question. So <laughs> uh, they consider them Ukrainian and they say generally the Kozak are opposing the Russian. You're telling me now that they are uh, Kozak Russian. How many are they? Really, it's, it's difficult to quantify, but if you quantify, then we have an idea of the phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I will start with a couple, first of all, of the number of the people who left. Unfortunately, we don't have the exact statistics, but thanks to the Ministry of Social Policy, 
according to the data provided the Ministry of Social Policy back in 2018-2019, they were providing the numbers by IDPs. It was 60,000 people relocated from Crimea, but obviously it's not the final number. There were more people who left because part of the people were not registered on the internally relocated people list. Because economically it's 400 hryvnia. It didn't make sense for a lot of Crimeans because I myself am internally relocated from Crimea and I didn't ha have this certificate for a long time. I didn't get myself on the re register because no one was understanding how this information was used and for what purpose. Now I have this now because we had pressure from Ukrainian government without this internally relocated person certificate you couldn't get a bank account. Now this restriction is rescinded. So we're talking about the number of around 100,000 Ukrainian citizens who left Crimea after the occupation. So is the threshold of talking about those who moved from Russia to Crimea? We were investigating, investigating the statistic information provided by the Russia itself. And as of 2018, the information confirmed by Russia, it's at least 140,000 people, the citizens of Russia who moved to Crimea after the occupation. But we're talking about the civil professions. So those are the land doctor, land teacher programs. So they don't, these numbers don't include the uh, employees of FSB and their families, the Russian military and their families. We understand that those numbers are very big. We see Crimea became a military base. So taking into account was the um, amount of the military in Crimea, uh, taking into account that they're there with their families. So the threshold number, the minimal number, is half a million citizens of Russian Federation who moved to Crimea, but we are unable to state the exact number because the number of military and FSB are classified. Some experts say that it's seven or eight hundred thousand. As as of the beginning of two thousand fourteen. The population of Crimea was uh, about 2 million people plus the city of Sevastopol, 400,000. So the approximate number is like 2 million people and a half as of the beginning of occupation before, so before Russia invaded it. And then at least half a million moved from Russia and at least 100,000 left Crimea, but it's still in progress. Unfortunately, I didn't have the interpretation or I didn't hear the question quite well. But as to the children, I, w I cannot say now that children can move separately from their parents, but uh, we can say about those who consciously choose Ukraine and after they reach the age of 18 years they moved to Ukraine for Ukraine in Ukraine the program was established for those relocated from Donbass and there we can fix it in 2015 that back in 2015 uh, starting from 10,000 graduates of the schools at least 15 percent moved to Ukraine and they they've chosen Ukraine so in 2000, 2021, we can talk about the numbers of those who entered the higher educational institutions from Crimea was 359. That's what I was talking about previously, the transition from one ethnic group to another because children lost their connection with their homeland. As to the ch children who moved 
as to the children who moved to Crimea from Russian Federation. So how many children are we talking about being under the influence of the Russian propaganda in Crimea? I missed the point. I don't understand. No. Yeah, yeah, right. L last year it was 220,000. They are the school children who currently study in Crimea this year, starting from the 1st of September, 230,000. And those 10,000 who added are those, uh, like this figure was previously more or less the same. And these 10,000 are those who are being relocated from Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. I can tell you that starting from September, uh, uh, children started getting relocated to Crimea for so-called improvement of health. It was a forced deportation. Why it was forced? Because their children, uh, their I'm sorry, their parents are being intimidated by intense warfare, and so to get their children out of danger, they are being offered to move to the camps in Crimea. And now it's about 1,500 children who were moved to Crimea without their parents, and they were located in Yevpatoria, in the sanatoriums. And two of, the, of these sanatoriums can operate during winter period, and two of them cannot work in winter. And now in Crimea, they start gathering warm things for those children, the parents are asking when their children are going to come back home, but but the response, the answer they are getting, that the children will stay for the second season. And it's a very big challenge for Ukraine because now the children keep being relocated and when they come back to Ukraine is unknown to us. Thank you very much. If there are more questions, let's talk individually to our speakers and we will wrap up for the time being. We were talking about the militarization by the Russia of ed education in the occupied territories and how this education can be used for the purposes of Russia. We were talking with Olga Skripnik, the, the head of Crimean Human Rights Protection Group and Valentina Potapova, head of Almenda Center for Civil Education, and Andrei Dikterenko, editor in chief of Realna Gazeta, will continue.